already, so. We are streaming live and let me share it to the mm. personal Grace Harris. Alrighty. Um, good morning, everybody from Australia, and good evening, good afternoon, if you are on the other side of the world. Welcome to another live episode of Women Unleashed, creating intergenerational transformation through the power of your lived experience and your personal story. This morning, I have a guest from Dallas, Texas, Dr. Brittany Claiborne, and we are going to be talking about how we can li really live with intention and to evolve instead of just surviving. I'm your host, Grace Harris, and my passion is to be able to help you transcend any trauma and adversity that you've been through, and especially if you are a woman of substance who are who's looking to use the power of your lived story as a framework to help other people to become the best versions of themselves. And um, the guest that I have today, Dr. Brittany Claiborne, or Brittany, um, she has gone through some things that probably 1% or maybe less than 1% of the human population actually goes through seven deaths in seven years and a cancer diagnosis and she's a mom she's a mom like many of us so the uh you know the layers of the dynamics of her emotions and psychology during that time i'm really interested to ask her and i haven't asked her before this is going to be completely spontaneous and this is the beauty of women unleashed is that it's not it will be recorded yes but we actually have the conversation live with you ladies and gentlemen so without further ado let me welcome uh, Brittany. how are you i'm well thank you so much for having me grace i appreciate you holding space for us to be here and to be able to tell our stories in such an authentic way it is my honor and I am really, really grateful for your time, really, really grateful for this space that we have between ourselves and the people that are listening to us. Um, please take us through your story because it is a very, very, um, yeah, exceptional and amazing story. Absolutely. Um, so in a, in a timeline type fashion, uh, in 2010, I had my first and only son. He was two pounds and uh, he went to the NICU and I went home. But about three days later, I was readmitted back into the hospital with peripartum cardiomyopathy or unexplained weakening of the heart muscle. Um, they believed that I had a heart attack during labor and that my heart function had decreased significantly. So my son was in the NICU and I was in cardiac ICU. Um, my, my mom and my husband at the time were running, <laughs> running back and forth between the two places, trying to make sure both of us have what we needed. Um, I was, I was released and I was just given some medicine to take some pills. They said, okay, you know, we'll just, we'll just kind of try to have the heart reshape itself. You're young, you're healthy. I was 26. Um, before then I'd been completely healthy, never had any health issues. Uh, so they said, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. This is a condition that could get really bad, but that only happens to one in every, you know, a million women or, you know, half a million women. So you should be fine. Uh, as time went on, my heart began to weaken more. So they installed a pacemaker. <clears throat> and over the next seven years, that pacemaker saved my life seven times. Seven times I died and was shocked back by, by that pacemaker. If it had not been there, I probably would not be here. Um, there was one time I was driving that I, that I died and got shocked by my pacemaker. Um, there was another time I was sitting in my living room and my son was sitting at my feet and I died and was shocked by my pacemaker. Um, there have been times I was just in the kitchen cooking, just doing normal everyday things. So once that happened so many times, they decided that the heart is not going to get better. It's not going to get stronger. Um, all of those shocks and so on and so forth create scar tissue. Mm -hmm. So we will have to move forward 
with the next intervention, which is heart transplant. I was 29. Um, that wasn't a part of my plan. Mm -hmm. So they said, but here's the problem with the heart transplant. You have very high antibodies. Your body is very, very strong. I, I was a person that I didn't get the flu. I didn't get colds, so on and so forth. And as moms, not only do we have our own antibodies, but we also have the antibodies of our children that we carried. So it's like trying to match two people because I had one other kid. If you had three children, then you would have the antibodies of all of those children. Um, so it's quite harder to match a woman that has had a child than it is to match a male because he's only carrying his antibodies. I'm carrying mine and Micah's. You're carrying yours and your children's, right? Um, so they said, well, listen, your heart is, is very, very weak to the point where we can't even send you home. We, we don't think you will make it if we send you home. So we're going to admit you to the hospital until a heart becomes available. Of the hundred hearts that you're offered, just to give you an idea of how hard it was going to be to match me, they said the, of the hundred hearts that we may have come available, your body will reject 97 of them. So there's about a 3% chance that we'll find a good heart for you. So let's admit you to the hospital. We wanna make sure that you have the best chance to get the right heart. So we wanna have you here in the hospital. We wanna keep you close. Um, and I said, well, how long will I have to wait in the hospital? Because of course, at this point, this is 2016. So I have a five-year-old at home. Um, and they said, you know, well, hopefully it just takes a couple of weeks. Um, so I said, you know, I'm probably going to go crazy in ICU. So I'm going to start a master's program while I'm in here and just kind of keep my brain busy. So I started my master's program while I was in ICU waiting for the heart. Nine months later, I was still in ICU and I was done with my master's program. So I said, okay, listen, um, <laughs> I've got to get out of here. <laughs> um, I finished a master's degree and I still don't have a heart. So they said, well, we have one other option. We can give you what we call an LVAD or a left ventricular assist device. It's sort of like a mechanical heart. It's a mechanical, it's a mechanical ventricular system. So they went in and you can see my scar here. Um, they went in and they attached it to the left side of my heart. And then I carried this bag around and there was a wire, like a, a plug essentially that came out of my stomach. Um, and I would plug myself into a wall or I had a battery pack that I would carry around, but I had no pulse anymore because I was, I was living on a battery operated heart. Um, so my son, you know, he's, he's five or six years old and my battery would beep and he would run into the room. He'd like, mommy, I have a battery here. Here's a battery. Um, because at, at five, he knew well, if that battery dies, mom, mommy does too. Um, so that was a lot as well, just handling that as an adult, that's hard to process, let alone for a five-year-old child. Um, so continuing on, I got the LVAD in August of 2016. And in January of 2018, I was readmitted to the hospital because the LVAD wasn't, it still wasn't doing, it, it, it basically started failing again. My heart was getting even sicker. Um, so I was in the hospital and, and while I was in the hospital, um, I got so frustrated. I was like, God, I am, I'm really tired of being here. So I quit. I don't want to wake up tomorrow. Um, the one thing that I had been, that I had felt that, that God wanted me to do is I felt like he wanted me to write some type of a, a book, just kind of detailing my journey and some of the lessons that I'd learned. And I said, you know what, I'm going to write this book you told me to write. And then I'm going to order some steak and shrimp and I'm going to bed and I don't want to wake up tomorrow. I'm done. I'm done. I'm finished. So that's what I did. I, I woke up at seven o'clock that morning and I spent the whole day, January 12th, 2018. I spent the entire day writing down the lessons that I've learned and I compiled them into this book called Shadow Boxer. Um, and after I finished that, I called the chef. I said, I want steak and shrimp. And he was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Of course, at the hospital, he's like, okay. So he sends up my steak and shrimp and I've submitted the book to the editor and 
as I'm chewing my last bite of my meal, my phone rings and I'm like, God, this better be you on this phone. Cause that's the only person I want to talk to right now. So I pick up the phone and it's my doctor and he says, Brittany. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, we have a heart for you. And I said, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about all the antibodies? Like you said, I've got like a thousand antibodies and at least 500 of them has to match. How many antibodies match? And he said, all of them, every single one matches. It's, it's a perfect heart. It's perfect. Um, I said, okay, that's, that's amazing. Let's, let's do it. So the next day we went into transplant and transplant was great. It, it went well. Um, and I was recovering really, really well. That was January, 2018. I was going to go, I was going to come to Australia in January of 2019 to celebrate, um, surviving really. And I went to the hospital for my checkup. It was uh, November of 2018. I said, I just kind of want to get a one over done, just make sure everything looks good. They said, you have about 300 lesions between your spleen and your liver and it's all cancer, you have stage four cancer. And I just, I said, okay, (laughs) what do we need to do? So we did chemo and we did radiation. And those two didn't quite quite work. So we took one last shot with a trial drug and the trial drug finally worked and got me cleared of cancer in February of 2020. And then in March of 2020, COVID hit. (laughs) Here I am. (laughs) So now here we are. Now I'm having a conversation with you. (laughs) That's a lot, right? I know, I'm sorry. (laughs) No. Wow, like, you know, um, there has, now I understand why you have a strong desire, this passion, this absolute vision to inject the change that's been so lengthily infused into you from 2000 and was it 16 or 15 until, um, well, finally, you thought in February of 2020, and then COVID right. hit, and um, Australia. And now we're to- all dealing with that in a mental capacity together. Mm-hmm. Wow, you know, um, I almost cried when you were telling the story, but there was like an energy about you that you, you, me as the receiver of your story, and you are a speaker and an author, and this is what you do, Brittany, is you motivate and inspire pe- people through the power of your words, the power of your wisdom, the power of your energy. As a receiver of your story just then, there was a part of me that was you know, almost in tears, but there was also a part of me that was being carried through by the energy that you have and um, could not really verbalize what that is, but if I was to name them, there was strength, there was faith, there was resilience, there was humor into it. <laughs> You were like, I'm (laughs) going to have my steak and shrimp. That's it. Going to write this book. I'm, (laughs) you know, and that better be you on the phone. And it's, it's really, (laughs) and this is what I, I love to, you know, I'd love to get into deeper into your psychology because there's so many layers there. You were like, okay, um, two weeks. Fair enough, but I don't want to go nuts in here. So I'm going to stimulate my brain and enroll in my master's. Nine months later, you're still in there and you're like, I'm over this. I've graduated my master's and now what? Like so, And then you were carrying that battery for two years, for, for two years. And, and, you know, and, and obviously a, t- a day had to come where I, this is really, I'm done. I just want my steak and shrimp, but not before I write the book. <laughs> so well, I guess you know, the book was, the book was about obedience. It, it really was. It was about obedience. It was about if I am going to leave this earth, if I am choosing to willfully lay my life down, I've got to make sure that I leave a roadmap for somebody somewhere. Like all of this can't be in vain, if that makes any sense. Um, so I, I, the writing the book was more about making sure that anyone else that has to walk this road, um, they understand that they're not alone because it, it's, it's, a lon- it's a lonely road. It can be a really, really lonely place. Yeah. yeah. Really you know, 
it's that is so powerful and interesting i want to spend a couple of minutes on what you just said then you wrote the book it was about obedience none of this can be in vain like you surely i cannot say i've had enough and just forget about everything because it was it, it was not to be in vain it was about obedience to god or to the divine to yes. to repurpose um, the, the journey that you've had and um how it's powerful for me personally as a healer myself is that um i do believe that when you put the energy out there that there is an intention there is a purpose there is a bigger vision to the journey that you've been through it's almost as if you are self prophesizing and in your case mm -hmm. Brittany you you know you, you kind of like had this you've encapsulated the whole thing without intentionally doing so and saying there has to be a purpose yes i'm tired but there is a purpose here and just by you doing that unintentionally god had almost said well here's a heart it's the purpose. <laughs> right. you know it, what it I mean? was it was i mean I, I can't tell you i was literally chewing the last bite of my steak and i was like i am done i'm, I'm so over and and the phone it, it's not like two hours late in the midst of me saying this is it i've done what you've asked me to do i've put it out there i've I'm repurposing my journey. I did that. Now let me go. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to let you go. Now that you have, now that you have stepped outside of yourself and repurposed your journey for others, now I'm going to heal you because you've told the hard part of the story. Now you have to be able to tell the healing part of the story. So I have to heal you in order to be able to tell that piece of it. Yeah. He was like, you ain't, you ain't finished, girl. <laughs> <laughs> You've only just started. You've only think, just begun. Yeah. Only just um, begun. I'd like to um, ask you, because so many of us are living in such uncertain times now. And when it comes to uncertainty, you were the queen of that. For many <laughs> the queen. Oh man, is that a title I want, Grace? <laughs> <laughs> no. But for many years at the time, you lived in it and you embraced it and so and, and and you now are passionate about helping us understand you know instead of just surviving live with intention live with evolution oh, that's how do my we word. do this that's how my do word. we do this yes in 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 times of uncertainty how excuse me that was my cat um, <laughs> um i usually have a dog yeah. barking around here but he's he's not here today <laughs> yeah so um how do we tackle uncertainty, Brittany? Um, first of all, with gentleness. Being able to be gentle with yourself in those times is so important. Um, we, and I'm, I'm sure I, I can't speak for men because I'm, I'm not a male, but I know as a woman, I know as a mother that for instance, when COVID hit, all of these uncertain things were happening. So I felt it was my job, not only to steady my own ship, but to steady the ship of my child. And in that space, sometimes we forget that we, the mothers, are human too. We forget that we need to care for us first. We forget that we need to take a step back and give ourselves grace for missing a moment. Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes, especially when it comes to uncertainty, we get we can get frustrated because we didn't plan for it. But that's the beauty of uncertainty. If I could have planned to be a heart transplant patient and a cancer patient while I was raising a child, I would have done a whole lot better. <laughs> Not only that, but I wouldn't have this incredibly empathetic little boy. He's going to see the world completely different because of my uncertainty and because of how I navigated through it. It wasn't always pretty it, and it's still not always pretty. But the fact that we have grace is really, truly what I think is going to carry us from uncertainty to evolution yeah yeah i was I, yeah that is so true the gentleness 
I was saying to, I think it was my partner two days ago, um, she, he, we were asking each other, do you like you? <laughs> and I said to him, yes, I like me because I'm kind to me now. I never mm. used to be kind to me. And I realized that kindness begins within. And like you said, as a mom, I used to be the type of mom who was a control freak. And this is what you talk about, you know, you think you want to plan something and if it doesn't go the, the way that you planned it, you freak out and you're not happy about it. And that I used to be that way. And I used to beat myself up and I never gave myself grace. Mm. I never gave myself grace. I was, um, I was always at fault. I was always frustrated. And, um, and I know uh, Brit, um, you love, you know, the healing part that you went through it is now a healing power that you share with others so um, when it comes to this is a word that sometimes can get very controversial when it comes mm -hmm. to healing because as a society as a whole we have different perceptions of healing um, there you know some of us have a perception that is purely medical it's purely scientific and there are um, an, an extreme group of us uh, that perceive healing to be that it has to be purely organic and purely um, non-medical at all. And there are those who are coming from the um, aspect of it has to be purely energetic. And I, I like to be holistic in the way that I approach healing. But um, personally for me, especially where I came from, I grew up um, in Southern Philippines and I remember when I was a little girl, I was fascinated by these people that we used to call, um, uh, it's in, in the Philippines, it's called albulario, which in, if you translate that in, in, uh, in Latin, it's like a herbalist. And what they did is that they uh, would uh, cure you with herbs and with the power of their hands and the energy that they have. As a, as a, I was so fascinated by them because they were hard to find. But the thing is that they were frowned upon. They were looked upon as a woo-woo and um, voodoo. But um, from now from a holistic perspective as an adult woman, and knowing that I myself healed myself a lot, you know, with the help of my doctors, but also energetically and with the power of my own psychology and my own heart, I want to ask you, um, you know, your healing journey itself, how do you, when you are, as a speaker and as an author, how, what is the main message of healing that you like to convey to the human, the humanity? Mm. That's a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> so let, let me tell you, let me tell you where the doctor came from. After I, I have a doctorate in psychology and after when I got diagnosed with cancer and kind of in that in-between space, when I was kind of done with transplant, but right before cancer, um, I was having all of these was healed physically this was fine the scar was healing but like you said there was some energy and there were some mental things I was going through um and and my doctors couldn't give me a medication for that not that would heal it it would give me something that would stifle the thought but I didn't want it stifled I wanted to understand and process and release it mm. so I looked around for essentially a critical illness psychologist I was like I need someone that can help me with these psychological thoughts, the energy, that stuff in the healing space. Mm. That's what I need. And I couldn't find one. So then I got the cancer diagnosis. And I said, while I'm in chemo, I will also study psychology and get my doctorate so that I can become the person I'm looking for. Mm. Um, so once again, I wouldn't be in this education space, in this speaking space without the, the journey of the heart transplant, without the journey of the cancer. I would be working at a Fortune 500 company. I'd be in my, I don't know, 15th year there, still doing the same job and happy, but not fulfilled. If that makes any sense. So when it comes to 
the healing space. Um, for me personally, as a Christian, when I finished my doctorate and I said, okay, God, how do I help people heal? What do I do? When I opened my Bible, it fell to this verse. And the verse is, I believe it's Luke 423. And it simply says, I've never seen this verse before in my life. <laughs> I've been a Christian my entire life. It says, physician, heal thyself. <gasps> right? That's what I did. So I said, I don't understand what you mean. And that's exactly what he meant. He meant going through the process of healing myself, I will find the way to heal others. Um, so right now I am in the process of doing that. I am in the process of healing myself and really truly understanding me and understanding my thoughts and my energy. And like you said, you healed yourself internally. That has to happen first. Doctors could throw prescriptions at you all day long, but if you don't heal in here first, if you don't heal your energy, if you don't heal your heart, if you don't heal your soul, then the medicine is just masking the issue. Mm -hmm. And that mask is a lot to carry around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot to carry around. So, um, so I'm in the process right now of, of working on this thing called, uh, I call it the script, but it's written the RX, like a prescription. Um, and it is specifically the first one that I'm doing, I'll do several, but this first one that I'm working on is specifically for patients that have experienced some type of a critical illness. Um, because like I said, the doctors are great at healing our bodies, but what about my mind? What about my soul? What about my spirit? What about the space that I have to live in? Yes, we live in our bodies, but really and truly we live in a soul space. And I didn't understand how good it felt to live in the purity of your own soul until I started healing myself. I thought I did. I, I thought I was good. And then you start healing. You're like, oh, wait a minute. That hurt. <laughs> that still hurts. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question or not, oh, but yeah. that's, that's basically the, mm. basically where I am is, is healing myself. And in, in that, healing others yes because what it shows us is when you when you are openly um, healing yourself and openly sharing your journey it shows us that there is a healer within all of us mm -hmm. and like you said anyone can give you all these prescriptions and um, recommendations but that is just to mask the symptoms and the only person that really understands us inside of us is the one that lives in it, which is us. Okay. And so the physician is us, the healer is us. And mm -hmm. how we can do that, then we can partake with others. The power of understanding oneself, isn't it? I think there was That's this, exactly uh, right. mm, what was that uh, saying from a uh, quote from Jung? Uh, he who looks outside, he who your dreams, but the one who looks within awakens. Mm, that's correct. Yeah, awakening yeah. to your, to what you can really do. Right. Uh, because yeah, I've, I've, I have heard many, many um, stories of people that I know directly now that they have been told they're never gonna walk again, or mm. they only have so much to live or something to that effect. And then they have this attitude that says, oh, is that right? You just watch me. That's terrible news. <laughs> I know, right? Like, I mean, um, they do have basis when they say those things, medical uh, professionals. And it is it is from what they have, you know, respectfully, it is valid and right. true. Absolutely. But deep within, yeah, deep within, we, we know, we know deep. That's, that's that's my thing is I myself have been given something it's not it's nowhere near critical but someone years ago had said to me that I had a degenerative disease on my knee that it was only going to get be worse not better I was only like 36 and 37 and I was so appalled by what they said and I'm like uh it's no <laughs> so I had yeah just had this knowing like you cannot tell me that I have a life to live 
you know. So um, so it was just a decision that I made, uh, and and any time we can make that decision, that we will either um, go along with an outside opinion or know ourselves, know right. thyself, and and get right. within. Mm. And there's, so, there's um, so much to that. So much yeah. to knowing yourself and and wanting to, you know, I I it, I it I get it I laugh at myself a lot because I'll be sitting at my desk and I'll go, I feel like I have nothing to do. What should I be doing today? And I always come back to that physician, heal thyself. Like there's always work to be done. There's always something that we can be doing to to move forward. Um I used to think that. I used to think that healing was a plateau place. I used to think it was a place you get to and you stay right there, but it, it's not. It is an ever changing precipice that as you, you know, as you get to one plateau, you'll say, huh, that was a little higher. I think I want to go see, I think I, think I want to go see the view from up there, you know? Um, but if you don't start climbing, you will forever believe that life is just this flat plane. And that's, that could not be farther from the truth. There are so many levels of us, so many levels of self that we, that so many unfortunately will not explore because I, I don't know what their why is. I, I don't know what their why is. I would be one of those people had I not gone through what I've gone through. I would be a person that was sitting there comfortable going, I mean, I'm good. Why would I what, heal from what? I'm fine until you're able to sit down and ask yourself a question, like, am I really fine? Or do you like you, you know, um, questions like that. So I think those are so important mm -hmm. in our constant growth, not to mention as mothers, we are living in insanely uncertain times and being able to model that for our children, I think is so important being able to say, I'm not okay today. I'm not, I'm not good today. And if you're having a bad day, son, it's, that's okay too. You can have a bad day and we can talk about it and we can figure out how best to help you through this day. We've created such a stigma around, you know, we'll heal bodies. People, people talk about all the time. Oh, I have cancer or oh, I have this, or I have that but you never see anybody say I have a mental illness or I'm struggling mentally. It's just not something that's accepted. And, but people will go and make a GoFundMe for anything else, right? But they won't okay. make, they, they won't talk about healing the mind. And that, mm. that's another thing that I, I, I want to change. There's so much value in healing holistically, like you said, there's so much value in healing the whole being that leaving out the part that helps you get to the true healing, which is your mind, is we're, we're, we're doing ourselves an injustice. Mm. I'm not talking about that, I'm not putting that out there. Yeah. Um, <sighs> I'm healing sorry. the mind healing the mind is such a double sometimes it can be a what is the saying double bladed or double edged sword double edged sword yeah. yeah um because what personally in my journey and with the people that i help in in you know in the field that i coach which is about speaking from your heart and uh, women empowerment in general is that once you start to learn how to speak from your heart and really express your truth, which is nothing to do with the words that you're saying or the quality of your voice, but really the truth from within you or the power of your story. Once you learn to do that, then you start to heal the mind. But that is a journey, though. And the, 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 uh, the dysfunction that I see commonly when, when it comes to healing the mind a lot nowadays is that we tend to because I've been through it initially years and years ago, I tried to heal my mind with my mind, um, which mm. means that I, you know, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was, I was self sabotaging all the time getting into toxic relationships, and I was getting sick physically as a as a result of so I had some mental health 
struggles from issues of abandonment and lack of love and all of that from from way 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 back long ago and the thing, how i was trying to do it was i was trying to healing my mind with my fractured mind and so it was like you're rubbing salt on a burnt skin you yeah. know and and i wrote this article in december 2019 i think it was and it was called um the age of sage because i think now that we, it's time for us to to get to know the truth that to heal our minds we've got to come down to the heart and we've Absolutely. got to be vulnerable and open that heart and be willing to be exposed um, and be willing to seek help and be willing to say today is a freaking terrible awesome day and i just need to freaking crawl up in the freaking corner and i'm you know That's i right. need to, yeah it, being able to just and um i guess the question that i have for you brit is that when someone is in that space because even especially when you go through the initial phases of critical illness you can get angry you Absolutely. can say you can question god you know like why me <laughs> people do that <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I was one of them. Absolutely. How do you deal with such fear and such, yeah, angst? Um, man, um, you have great questions. <laughs> you have fantastic questions. Initially, you don't. Um, initially, it's it's a very scary and a very frustrating journey. Um, especially, like you said, without the healing. And, and you're right, that is one of the main issues. One of my favorite lines from a movie is this guy says, um, and it's a psychological movie, and he says, I can do this. I can, I can, I can, I don't need medicine. I can do this. I can do this with my mind. And she said, his, his wife tells him, your mind is the problem. Mm. And that's, you you were dead on when you said I was trying to heal my mind with a fractured mind. It doesn't work. It has to come from here. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from the soul. It has to come from that space within you that exudes out when you when you are authentically you. When you are in your happy place, when you feel most like yourself, that soul space that's the part of you that has to heal the mind and in order to do that that part of you has to heal as far as going through all of these things and how to handle that unless you have that healing of the soul happening it, it's going to be a difficult journey because the energy just the pure soul energy that is required and you know this you you went through this so the soul energy that is required of self to put down your ego and said i and say no ego you're not driving anymore i am going to allow my soul i'm going to align my chakras i am going to allow this self to heal my mind that that's hard because it takes what we know as our self out of control right? It takes us out of the driver's seat. And we're like a parent teaching a kid how to drive. We're pressing on the imaginary brakes. Like, we're like, wait, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> like, no, I don't want to go that way. But it's, but it's true. So like, for instance, in this, in this, this, in the script that I'm writing, the first step is release, or the, the acronym that I'm using as a whole is release. But the R specifically stands for respect. And it's about respecting yourself. That R is all about respecting your journey. My journey and your journey are completely different, completely different. And every woman you've talked to, your journey is different, but you are able to exist in this beautiful space of soul because even though the journey starts in a different place, true healing places us all in this beautiful, beautiful space of evolution. Mm. And if we are able to take that journey from the caterpillar to the butterfly, then we are truly able to, we're truly able to allow the world to see the beauty that we could be. But so many people resist the cocoon, 
is what I call it, right? They don't want to go into the cocoon, not knowing that by going into the cocoon, you are not going to come out. It's not the end. It's merely a transition to an evolutionary part of yourself. So in going through that process, so you and I, based on just what we've talked about here, have gone through that cocoon. Some of us forced me, and <laughs> and, but you willingly climbed into it because you wanted to heal. You wanted to change. I was kind of forced into it, but I'm glad I went because I like my butterfly colors now. So, <laughs> and that's what it comes down to. It comes down to being willing to say, I know I don't want to be this caterpillar anymore. And I don't know what's going to happen when I go into this cocoon. But if I don't, I know that I will die a caterpillar and I don't want to die here. Mm. So it's about making that choice that I don't know what's on the other side of it, but I do know that I don't want to stay on this side. I do know that there is something more. I often ask people, what if the place that you're existing is no longer the place that you belong. Wow. Because there are so many instances of that. If I were, if you were an infant still in your mother's womb and I were to come into the, your womb and say, hey, I know you love it here and I know it's great and warm and you're getting food and everything, but you're not gonna stay here. You were only here for a period of time to grow and learn. And now that you've grown and learned, you're actually going to be transitioned into a completely different world. And I mean, just imagine how different that is for that infant. You've spent your entire life being fed through your stomach. And I come and tell you, hey, that thing on your face, that's actually where you'll get food now. So not only are you being pushed into a different place of existence, but your sustenance, your, your livelihood is coming from a different place. And that's hard. No wonder babies cry. I would cry, right? <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why are and people talking to me? What is this light? What is this? <laughs> but to know that everything that's formed in the womb, none of it that they use here is used in there. Their eyes are not used. Their ears are not really used. Their mouth is not used. Not for the same things it'll be used for here. So, so many of us get stuck in that womb place and we go, well, I feel like I've outgrown this place. Well, you have, and you need to be pushed into the next dimension. But if there's no one to push you, or if you just don't want to leave, because some people will hang on for dear life, right? <laughs> I am not going to evolve. I am going to stay here. Then then you wind up in this very uncomfortable space because you've outgrown the place that you were supposed to be growing out of. Mm. Wow, that's so I'm powerful. I love, I love, love that question. What if the place that you exist right now is no longer where you belong? It's, right. it's such a beautiful question because mm -hmm. I can imagine being in pain of, I'm not liking it here anymore, but grown it. But then you still have that fear of, but then if I push through what could be possible, how much more uncomfortable would that be compared to now? So maybe I'll just stay here. You know exactly. what I mean? Like there's this indecision. But then if you ask it that way, what if where I am right now is no longer where I belong because I am being called for, it's time for me to change the way that I am, no longer taking in food through the belly button, but using different parts, becoming different, and for a higher purpose. It right. really is, you know, we've got to ask ourselves questions that shake us to the core. You That's have right. to ask yourself because no one else is going to ask you the question. Like people are going to be polite and say, oh, are you okay? Did you have some food today? <laughs> you've got right. to ask yourself. Oh, the difficult questions. Yeah. That is, and, and I love that. I love that. Yeah. So that's, I am that's so, kind of where I, yeah. where I start is going, if I am working with a person one-on-one, -on -one, that's kind of the place that I, I start. I say is the place that you're existing right now. What if it's no longer where you belong? What if you've outgrown that space? Do you feel uncomfortable? Because you know, you'll have people as a coach, you understand, you'll have people that say, I just, 
I feel like I'm not, I feel like there's something else I'm supposed to be doing, or I feel like there's, you know, I feel like there's more. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, <laughs> you've been in this womb state and now it's time to push, but you're stuck here because like you said, this is uncomfortable, but what if that's more uncomfortable? <laughs> I can't come back this way. So, <laughs> so do I just want to stay in this small space or do I want to, you know? Um, so yes, that is absolutely important in, in healing and in growing and in just becoming the people that we want to be, whether we've gone through, like I say that I am writing this for patients based on critical illness. Well, that's because I have a lot of inside knowledge about critical illness, but I completely plan on writing one that's just for, because, you know, critical illness, we think, okay, cancer, heart failure, stuff like that. And yes, it is. But this same thing could be applied to someone that's going through depression or that's going through a divorce or that's going through just an everyday normal situation. And it's just about moving forward. And, and like that acronym says, it's just about releasing and evolving to the next level of who you're supposed to be. Yes. I mean, your work is important. Um, that, uh, the, the book that you're writing right now, because life transitions are all critical. I mean, it just doesn't have to mm -hmm. be. A That's person. true. That's right. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So, 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 so true. Um, I have loved this conversation. I wish we had so much more time. But what I want to ask you from you, from, from you, Brittany, today is that um, please let us know how we can um, access, uh, well, what you're writing right now and the book that you wrote before, but how we can, for, for those out there who want to have you in their, in their space, in their summits, in their companies, to have you speak for them and motivate and inspire their people. Let us know how we can access that. But not before I ask you one last question. I just want okay. to, uh, I just, if you could leave us with one, you know, with one thought, with one wisdom from yourself that we can go to bed with tonight, what would you say mm. to us? Mm. I would say faith in something is necessary, but faith in yourself is vital. You absolutely have to know that you are and you contain everything that you need to heal. You have to know that you are the missing piece. You are what you Whoa. are. Wow. Thank you. I'm going to write that down. Faith in something, <laughs> is, is, in something is, is, is important, but faith in yourself is vital. I am the missing piece. You are. You are. Wow. That is ultra, super califragilistic, powerful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, so how can we have more of you? How can we um, get in touch with you, please? Absolutely. So my um, my Facebook, my as far as social media, I'm on Facebook, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, and all of those are um, my handle that you see here up at oops, other side at the top here um, at Dr. Brittany Speaks. Um, I have one, the, the book that I wrote during heart failure, I have that out on Amazon. It's called Shadow Boxer. And on April 6th, there will actually be um, actually in the process of releasing an anthropology uh, called Elevate Your Voice. And this is Courageous Stories to Inspire Strength, Perseverance, and Hope. And I've written it with 14 other ladies. And we are all sharing our stories of just different things that we've gone through in life. Some people that, like you said, life transitions in every regard are critical. And, and that's what this is about. This is about life transi transitions in every regard, whether it's losing a parent, whether it's losing a, a, a marriage, whether it's heart failure, whether it's starting a company, it's about transitioning and truly evolving to the next level of self. So that will be available for purchase on Amazon, <clears throat> excuse me, on April 6th. 
here in the U.S. Um, otherwise, you can always just go to my website to get books or to once again access me, and that's just BrittanySpeaks.com. Grace, it has been my absolute pleasure to join you today. And mine, mine, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in with us. And uh, please feel free to share this message, this conversation to anyone that you feel um, is going to benefit, take away, and be inspired by the conversation between Brittany, Brittany and I today. Thank you so much, everyone. We love you. Thank you so much, Brittany. And have a beautiful, beautiful Wednesday or Tuesday evening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.